that will go out and open up Notepad and browse to a file share that's on a recovered server and try to open this text file called answer to life.txt. As an example, there it is, 42. In this case, it's working. Well, in this case, I'm actually contacting the live server that's already running. It hasn't been recovered. So this command script really isn't much good when I'm doing a test if the if I don't power down the old the old site. This actual script here would only be something useful in the case of a full failover when I've shut down the primary site because this would actually run against the replicated critical server and and go out to its file share to test that this that that file share was there. You can get as, as creative as you can get with your commands is is really the limit to what you can do. You can have PowerShell scripts to change IP addresses or restart services. There's a lot of options, all of which we can't really cover in this lesson. But what I do want to do here is that I, I know that the command will work in a failover, but in a test scenario, how can I go on and, and, and test this? Now I could do some things with networking and whatnot so that the test network is accessible from the virtual center network. But for me, I'm pretty simple and this is a simple test. So this is a perfect segue into helping me show you the next thing you can use to customize your recovery plan, which is called a message or a message step. So what I'm gonna do here is click on the command line or the command line that we just entered, right? So that I know that it's highlighted so any step I add is going to be inserted after the command. Well, since I that command won't necessarily run well in my test recovery plan, and actually I'll back up. Why is it going to run well in my test recovery plan? We talked earlier about doing that test plan and that it created a bubble network within the recovery site vSphere environment. That bubble network securely fences in the recovered virtual machines. And we can't run scripts against it from an outside source without some networking kung fu. So what I'm going to do is add a message step, which is this, the third from the left here, the one right next to the command. Go ahead and click that. And similar as before, except now I'm not putting in code, I'm actually putting in or typing in a message to myself to notify myself or another recovery admin what to do when they get to this portion of the recovery plan. In my case, it's going to be manually test that critical server file share was recovered successfully. Thanks. <laughs> You can do whatever you need here. It's good to be concise and, and simple and not overuse these. But this message will actually pause the SRM recovery or the, the test at this specific spot and wait until there's been feedback from the administrator to, to move forward. Okay, so that does it for the recovery steps demo that I wanted to show you so that you could see what the actual recovery steps looked like and how we could add command steps in to add functionality from specific scripts and how to add in custom messages to pause the flow of the recovery plan and notify the, the administrators of other activity to do. Okay, in addition to looking at the custom recovery steps, there's also the option to take a virtual machine and move it into a different priority grouping. If we take a look at critical server here, critical server realistically needs to be up and running prior to critical PC, since the PC is the, the user access uh, tier, so to speak, and it needs to access the server. Well, if the server isn't up fo fully yet, we'll have issues. So what we'll want to do is raise the priority of critical server. To do that, just right click on the virtual machine within the recovery plan steps 
and you have the option to move it up or down. I'm going to choose move up. You can see it's now moved it up one step and it's now underneath the high priority virtual machine section. If you need to move something up a lot of steps though, there's no other way to do it but then to continue to click move up and down. In future iterations of VMware Site Recovery Manager, we're hoping that we'll be able to drag and drop multiple levels of steps. As you get dozens and you know sometimes hundreds of virtual machines in your recovery plan, moving them up one by one can could be a laborious task. So, but that's how you can change the priority of the virtual machines, and I'll go ahead and move one down into the low priority group just so you can see what we have going on. Okay, now let's discuss options for customizing the recovery of virtual machines at your recovery site. The needs for VMs at the recovery site are different than those at the protected site. So you'll need to create a game plan for reconfiguring VMs so that they can successfully operate in the different environment. In environments with fewer resources at the DR site, it might be necessary to tweak the amount of virtual resources allocated to your VM. This could be things like removing memory from the VM or possibly removing the number of CPUs, maybe down from eight to four or from four to two. The reason you might consider doing this is that although your protected site has adequate resources to function at a high level of performance throughout the day, a disaster recovery site might not be financed appropriately to do that. So this is a good way to make the most of your resources and provide some level of recovery for your business. Maybe not 100% function, but it's better than nothing. A way to automate removing of those resources could possibly be an SRM command step that calls a PowerShell script that could then in turn connect to the virtual machine, power it down and remove these resources. One of the more common customization steps is that of changing the network settings. And that is to make sure that the virtual machine has the correct network identity to function properly in the different environment at the recovery site. See, we can replicate data and boot the virtual machine, but if you can't access the VM and its data via the network, then you haven't provided much value that could be experienced with SRM. So we need to make sure the network piece is configured properly for the new data center. This usually comes down to the IP address, possibly the subnet, subnet mask, most definitely probably a different gateway, and the DNS servers may or may not be different. If you had DNS servers at the protected site that are no longer available because of, of the disaster, we might not want to then include them actually in the reconfiguration. Also, computer name and fully qualified domain name should probably not have to change since you're used to accessing them that way and most apps are as well so we shouldn't have to worry about that but we will have to make sure that the dns server gets updated with the new ip address that we configure if your dns server doesn't support dynamic updates you want to make sure that we consider adding a manual step within the srm recovery plan steps to possibly notify the administrator that dns would be something they need to change So we know it's important to change the network, but what are some of my options for changing the network settings upon a recovery at the, the new site? Well, there are many, but we're gonna focus on four main options or, or types of network reconfiguration. The first would just be plain old manual configuration. Here you would just wait until the VM is booted and then log into the VM console, change the IP through the standard tools that you would use with your operating system. This step um, could also be automated with your favorite flavor of script foo that you practice. But remember, the network visibility from the vCenter server into the VM might be an issue when you're trying to have your script talk to the VM over the network. So this would be something that you'd want to think about carefully prior to configuring. Second option could be DHCP and have that IP address dynamically assigned to the VMs. The replicated VMs could use this DHCP to get their, their address, but care should be 
taken in configuring this so that the correct IPs get assigned to the correct VMs. Or if nothing else, maybe you don't care about the VM, or excuse me, you don't care about the VM's IP, you do want to make sure that the, the correct DNS entries get updated with the new IP addresses now assigned out through DHCP. The third option is the one that most people would start with, especially in a small environment because it's the easiest and possibly the most familiar, and that is using a VMware guest customization specification. It's the method that we'll use to demonstrate in this, in this lesson. Folks familiar with deploying VMs from templates and then using guest customization to configure a computer name, the operating system ID, the, the IP for a Windows virtual machine would be familiar with this option. Guest customizations are done on an individual basis and they leverage the, the sysprep configuration files. So you'll want to make sure that the sysprep files get copied in to the correct location on the vCenter server. I'll quickly show you those when we go to demonstrate that process. Otherwise, the vCenter server administration guide is a good place to learn about this, or you can look at some of the, refer back to some of the other TrainSignal Pro Series VMware videos that, that talk about some of the same options, and they would probably show you there too. So, like I mentioned, this is on a per VM basis. So you'll need a guest customization specification for each VM. You could see how that could get very big over time. And since SRM can go up to hundreds of VMs, having hundreds of individual guest, custom, guest, guest customization files could be quite tedious to, to work through and to keep current. Because of this, VMware created a utility. Right now it's just a command line utility that can be used to run against your virtual machines to report back what their IP addresses are. And you can also use another utility to customize a group of virtual machines and their IP addresses. So if we're working on a very large SRM deployment, that, that utility would be something you very much want to look into. It's titled by its name, which is DRIP Customizer.exe. Now, this is a, a utility that you can find within the Site Recovery Manager's program, program files directory. You have the reporter exe, which can be used to report on it, and then the IP customizer, which is used to configure the IPs for the VM. Well, that does it for this lesson. We'll now dive into the demonstration of custom recovery options for VMs. Okay, here we're going to demonstrate some options for preparing a VM customization specification and create the plan to map IPs from the protected site into the IPs needed for the recovery site. To get started, let's hold, head back to the home screen. As you can see up top, I'm on the recovery VC, so we're doing this configuration from the recovery, the recovery site. Once I'm at the home screen, I'll need to create a customization specification. We do that through the customization specifications manager location. In here, I don't have any currently. I, I could have copied from one and, and edited a little bit so that we didn't have to recreate the wheel, but we'll go ahead and do that now. Click new. It is a Windows OS. We could do Windows and Linux. We're just going to do Windows right now. And I'm going to call this one Critical Server, since it's the customization for a critical server. And I'm going to make a designation that this is for SRM. Actually, I'm going to do that right at the beginning so that they sort nicely. I'm going to have to enter some information so I can proceed. This isn't necessarily used in the SRM sense of the guest customization uh, wizard, so we're just going to quickly enter in some, some options that make sense. I'm going to use the virtual machine name. Again, this is all dummy information. And the only thing of consequence when used for network reconfiguration is that we have the correct network stuff 
or excuse me, the net correct network information entered into the specification here. Good old central time zone. Great. Now we're at the network settings. This is really all that needs to be configured, and it's the most important. So since this is the critical server that we're mapping, I want to make sure that I give it a custom setting, since I'll be manually configuring the VM. And I click Next earlier, and then I highlight this, and there's a little box here with a, two ellipsis dots. Go ahead and click on that, and that brings up a form that you can use to enter in the network settings that you need. I'm going to use a static IP address in the recovery site, although I could use DHCP. A quick look, refer back to my mappings. My critical server is .61 at the protected site. I'm going to change it to .81 at the recovery site just to demonstrate the ability to reconfigure networks. If you've been paying attention, you'll realize that this isn't on a different network at all. This is just a lab setup. So I don't need to change anything. And changing the IP actually is just for for giggles here to, to demonstrate the capabilities of of the guest customization. So once I've entered in the IP addresses that I want assigned. To the recovered VM and verify that they are correct, go ahead and click OK. Then click Next to work through the rest of the wizard and finish. I now have a guest customization specification that I can use later. Actually, before we do that, let's create what we'll need for a critical PC as well. Okay, I enter all that dummy information so I can at least get to the network portion here. Once I'm here, I can click Custom Settings, Next. And again, I'll highlight that option for the NIC that I have and click the box with the ellipsis dots, then enter in the IP address that I would like to see configured for this PC when it's recovered in the recovery site. That is a virtual PC, actually. And I'll quick verify that I got the right mappings down there, 62 to 82. Looks like I got it in there correctly. So I'll go ahead and click OK, Next, Next, and Finish to get through those last few screens of dummy information. All right, so I got two guest customizations here. And to apply these to VMs, we'll go back into the SRM setup. To do that, we go to Home. Insight Recovery. Again, you'll get tired of me saying this, but I always like to see where I'm at to make sure I'm configuring the correct site. Local site is recovery site. We are in the right spot. So to add that customization specification that we just created to a VM, we need to go into the recovery plan. And we're already at the virtual machines tab, but you might end up here at summary first, to which you want to go to virtual machines. You'll highlight the virtual machine that you want to 
customize on the recovery, then click edit. And the very first screen is the option to choose a customization specification. To do so, we will click the browse button and find the specification that we just created for critical server. Remember that this is a one-to-one -one mapping and I don't want to use the PC specification against the critical server. That would give it the wrong IP. So I click OK. I could give it a description if I wanted to. But I won't. We'll go ahead and click Next now once we've chosen the specification. And you'll notice here that we got a couple steps that we've added pre-power on. I'm going to go ahead and remove those. If you're curious, you could add in a message that says pre-power on. Notice we will be changing the IP address. Please be patient. Anything could be entered in there, actually. So we'll click Next. Post power on, same thing could be done here. Maybe we'll add a message that says, please check the IP address for correctness. Should be 192.168.2.81. Now this might be a little overkill, but nothing else. I want to throw some message in there to show you that it could be helpful in managing your workflow. Actually, I have a message in there earlier said all done. Um, I might move that down actually. So I highlight it and I click on the move down button that has the effect of moving it down. So click finish when you're done. We have one more specification that we'd like to add, so click on Critical PC and Edit. Other than the names of your VMs that you're testing will obviously probably be different, but in this case I'm using Critical PC. I will browse out to the specification created for Critical PC and highlight it and click OK. Click Next to move forward. I'm not going to mess with messages or commands at this point. Finish and close. There we go. That's really all there is to putting in the guest customizations. What would be ideal though is that we possibly test those those customizations. Okay, so we talked about some options for conf reconfiguring VMs to meet the needs of their new environment that they live in. But it's also a good idea to talk about some options to avoid having to reconfigure those, those same virtual machine networks. One of those that we, we did talk about earlier, which technically is a reconfiguration of the IP, but it doesn't have to change the VM's configuration, which is DHCP. So once you've configured a VM for DHCP, you would you don't have to configure it Again, it, it's when it boots at the second site, it would then look for a DHCP server to get its IP configuration and all that. So using the, the choice to use DHCP would remove the complexity from the SRM configuration into the DHCP configuration. And administrators, administrators of that system would then have to make sure that virtual machines, when booting up in different sites, would get the correct configuration information. And as always, you're going to have to make sure that DNS gets updated correctly if you're going to use DHCP. But I, I mention it here because it is sort of a simplification of networking and it does avoid you having to change the VM before booting. So yeah, as I mentioned earlier, bringing up VMs in one environment in another 
or, or bringing up the, the VMs from one environment to another completely different one is a complex undertaking. And it should be avoided to have to reconfigure those VMs if we can. One way to avoid that and to kind of punt the problem somewhere else is to stretch a common layer two network between sites. And a way to do that traditionally has been by stretching a VLAN from one site to another. This is a specialized switch configuration that can create a virtual LAN from, from one piece of switching hardware to another at a remote site. Now, although you can do that, you maybe shouldn't do that. And we'll talk about some of the pros and cons later. The other most recent addition to options for, for creating a layer two network between many different sites is that of Cisco OTV or Cisco Overlay Transport Virtualization. This is a pretty exciting technology that has just come out and to my knowledge is the only one on the market today providing that type of feature. But really what it is is, is layer two networking delivered over layer three. So you can actually take a virtual machine and it can have a layer two identity and it can be routed on top of layer three networking, so TCP IP. Therefore, you can keep your IP addressing the same at all the different sites and keep some of the features and functionality of, of having that flexibility, right? But you can have specialized high availability VMs that would be protected by SRM in a Cisco OTV virtual network so that we don't have to go through the trouble of restoring their virtual machines networking settings for, for a different for a different environment. The final option that could be used to avoid reconfiguring VMs is using NAT or network address translation. This would be done by some sort of load balancing server or 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 firewall that, that can talk NAT and that's put in front of all the virtual machines, which is pretty useful in that it it reduces the, the need to reconfigure VMs, but it kind of increases complexity since all traffic has to go through that, that, NAT, that NAT layer in order to get to the VMs, which can reduce the performance of the solution. I see this being a great option though for internet workloads or workloads that are accessed from the internet. So web servers, maybe it's your, your company's mail server, Great options here because typically you're going to be connecting to those servers from your remote device, from your laptop, from a remote office. So they could care less whether that server is on the same network as they are because they're all on completely different networks. They're just looking for an IP. So having a, a NATed address so that when that mail server switches over or gets recovered at the recovery site, they're, they're none the wiser that, that there's a NAT device in, in front of them. That's good information, but it'd be nice to maybe visualize what we're talking about here. I just whipped up a quick diagram here to show you what it would look like if you, if you can't take a layer two network and stretch it across two sites. You can see on the left, we have our protected site, which is a, consists of a data center and a, we have a, a class B network here, a 10.2 network and some virtual machines that live on that side in the protected production environment. And those virtual machines are replicated through the magic of SRM and, and SAN replication, and they end up at the recovery site, which has a completely different network. 10.99 is, is the network over there. And in a red box here, I draw red because it's, it's difficult and complex to reconfigure, those virtual machines all have to be reconfigured in order to come up. So there, there's some complexity inherent in a two network setup. However, if we can stretch that layer two network across the two sites, we can still have SRM in the background, leveraging SAN replication to replicate the, the storage bits and bytes to the other side. And we have SRM to then automate the recovery in a specific order at the recovery site, but now we've completely taken that network reconfiguration issue and it's no longer. Because of the work and 
that we've put into the foundation for having a, a layer two network span two sites, we can now, I guess, harvest the fruits of our labor and 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 use SRM and, and completely boot those virtual machines without having to do anything to them. So that's a great benefit. As you can see, it's pretty easy to visualize having a single network over two sites. Although there are a few pros and cons with setting up a common layer two network across sites and basically with a stretched VLAN approach, which you can do with most enterprise class switches today, Cisco's and HP's can all do this sort of thing. The pro is simple. It's just as you saw earlier, you got a common layer two network. We don't have to go through network reconfiguration with SRM, so that's good. There are some cons with doing a layer two network uh, with uh, stretched VLANs. It's, it's inflexible in that it's it can be a little bit hard to configure for multiple sites, and it's it's really not built for that for this type of purpose for SRM. But there's also no specialized intelligence to handle broadcast, multicast, or spanning tree traffic between between sites. It truly is a stretched VLAN across networks, and and without the intelligence of sites being further apart. So although it it is helpful in creating a simple network configuration. It's also not necessarily something that you'd want to, to deploy in a widespread fashion because of the lack of, of intelligent features to provide, let's say, site-specific intelligence to networking. Cisco OTV, on the other hand, has the exact same pro. It's a common layer two network across sites. However, it also preserves the layer three hierarchy within your network and that each of your remote sites can continue to have its own networking addresses underlying everything. So routing and, and firewall access and access to internet can all stay exactly the same way that, it, that it's been. Uh, voice traffic could be the same way. However, there's a smarter handling of the multicast and the broadcast and the, and the spanning tree traffic that that brings a site intelligence to the, the switches controlling Cisco OTV. I don't want to make this a Cisco OTV commercial. You can definitely go on online, cisco.com and, and, and Google for Cisco, or, Cisco, or Google for Cisco OTV and look at some of the information on it. But it is uh, an emerging technology that would greatly simplify SRM as far as, and also lay down the foundation for, for future VM mobility technologies that allow VMs to, to move between sites. The major con though with Cisco OTV is today it requires specialized Cisco hardware, which most likely comes at a premium price right now. So it might not be within the grasp of the, the small and medium businesses out there, but I mentioned it anyway so that you can keep it in your in your list of technologies to consider when simplifying your site recovery manager design and architecture. Well, that does it for this lesson on custom recovery plans. Before we go, let's quickly review what we've learned. First off, we covered the recovery plan steps that are both common to the recovery test and to the actual failover or, or production recovery, so to speak. And we talked about how you can customize those recovery plans with custom command steps and custom message steps. We also explored the custom recovery options that would exist for each virtual machine and some common things that you would want to do in a recovery site when bringing up virtual machines. This included doing things to reduce the amount of resources allocated to individual virtual machines in the case where a DR site doesn't have the available capacity to host a 100% performing environment. But mainly we focused on the reconfiguration of network settings for the recovered virtual machines at the recovery site. We focused on VMware methods for individual virtual machines and groups using the VMware customization specification in order to create a specification file that can use Windows SysProp to use to reconfigure the network settings for the virtual machines. We also highlighted some non-VMware methods that might be of use to you, whether you're scripting or using DHCP. 
And finally, we focused on a few slides to talk about options that you could explore to avoid having to have custom network configuration within the SRM environment. These would be options to greatly simplify the overall amount of moving parts that SRM is, is responsible for and let it focus on what it does really good, which is restoring virtual machines in a certain order and controlling the SAN replication underneath to actually replicate the virtual machines. Well, that's all for this lesson on custom recovery plans. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next lesson.